Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ivan Haschic and Mikhail Maas, we are my colleague. We are from the OECD Environment Directorate and specifically the team working on environmental information and indicators. So we are always Um, you know, keen to learn, we are on the user side, so we are very keen to learn about all the exciting new projects you are involved in. Um, so, um, uh, I want to thank the organizers for um, this opportunity to present our, our work. Uh, thank you so much, and um, let me move on. So, um, very briefly, OECD is, um, which stands for Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, is an, is an inter intergovernmental organiza organization of 38 member countries across the world. Um, our basically main mission is to produce evidence-based policy analysis across all areas of government policy. Um, so the OE member countries are shown in blue here. Um, the what we call partner countries uh, are shown in red. And these are essentially of two types, either countries with whom um, or the OECD is in accession discussions to become eventually potentially a member country or uh, other, other countries which whom, with whom we have um, some sort of strategic closer cooperation in, in certain areas. So you see most of the G20 countries are there. So um, why, uh, why are we interested in Earth observation data? Um, it's because we see it as a, as a great opportunity to complement our existing data collection efforts. So many international organizations are involved in data collection from countries. Uh, however, the way we work is perhaps a bit different from uh, the UN system, the United Nations. So uh, we, first of all, the traditional way of collecting data is to send out annual data collection questionnaires to our member countries where we collect official so-called official statistics on, um, based on harmonized agreed methodologies. However, so this is, this is kind of, you would think, a, a good way to do things um, because the data are going to be harmonized. However, there is a limit to the number of variables and the depth of data, the detail you can collect thr through this kind of exercise. Very quickly, you will reach a limit to uh, what uh, the environmental statistics departments in countries can handle. Uh, they are usually understaffed, so th we cannot ask too much in terms of the reporting burden. So uh, that's why we turn to developing estimates um, drawing on country validated methodologies. We discuss these methodologies with countries, we discuss the data sources that we'll be using, and then we generate the statistics uh, for all member countries, potentially globally. So here, um, that's where Earth observations come in, and we will present today two use cases, um, one now, one uh, a little in the, in the next session. And finally, the hybrid approach, whereby we try to um, um, kind of take advantage of both approaches. I forgot to say for the estimates, of course, the advantage is that we have a global coverage, but um, the challenge is that uh, these uh, estimates are not always in line with uh, official statistics, so this uh, leads to some communication challenges. So uh, the third hybrid approach is really a combination of the two, trying to anchor the estimation on the official data and, and uh, fill with gap filling methodologies the rest. And we have done this on global emission inventories. We are working currently on global databases on land accounts and water accounts. So I'll, st I'll stop here and I pass over to Mikhail to present uh, the details. There you go. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So why do we uh, monitor air pollution? Um, it's one of the largest environmental causes of death worldwide. Also has huge morbidity issues. Um, in 2019, for example, uh, 4.5 million people or deaths were attributed to air pollution, outdoor air pollution specifically, and reductions in those deaths that initially happened due to reductions in indoor air pollution um, were largely um, offset in, in essence by outdoor air pollution. <coughs> there are considerable geographic differences in um, air pollution mortality and morbidity. 90%, um, for example, of most of the deaths occur in lower and middle income countries. And this disparity is even uh, larger, actually, sometimes within countries between poorer and richer 
uh, regions as well, also for developed economies. And this work on air pollution was really to look at the available Earth observation data sets that are out there and to really refine our methodology and to produce an indicator set. And so I'll present to you some key messages of that, that work and the experiences we've had doing this. So the, the health impacts from air pollution, to quickly summarize a bit, have both short-term and long-term health impacts. Um, there's short-term chronic asthma effects, um, headaches, anxieties. Um, there's long-term health impacts that can range from um, chronic asthma, but there's also, for example, new papers showing, for example, that certain air pollutants sometimes um, could even be linked to some neurodegenerative diseases, some types of dementia. And so all these different air pollutants all work a little bit differently sometimes. Um, and here are some three key ones that uh, we'll be discussing today, which is fine particulate matter, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide. DWHO um, has for a long time now actually been developing, um, doing meta-analysis and reviewing all the literature out there to develop a sort of interim target and air quality guideline level um, for various air pollutants. And um, the latest one that was done was in 2021 when the WHO released new guidelines. And here you can see in this table, for example, for fine particulate matter, these various interim targets that countries can try and reach um, towards this air quality guideline level. This air quality guideline level, we wouldn't call necessarily a safe level because any level of air pollution is theoretically uh, hazardous, um, but it's kind of the recommended level to go below for, for countries, for cities, for regions. So we identified up to 10 different um, global air pollution data sets um, that are available. These are a mix of sometimes only based on ground-based measurements, sometimes based on satellite data, sometimes they are a hybrid of both together. And there's three of those that we specifically were wanted to further analyze. Um, the Global Burden of Disease data set has been used by various international organizations and, and other institutions um, for mortality and morbid morbidity from for lots of different kinds of health impacts, but also for air pollution. Um, there's the CAMS reanalysis, which uses a lot of Copernicus and European Space Agency uh, data. And then there's Plume Labs. Plume Labs is actually a private company. And uh, yes, we were lucky to convince them to sort of work with us, to share their data with us, so that we could study how good this data is in, compar in comparison to other data sources. And on the right, you see here uh, results, for example, for the, on the left, global burden of disease data set, and on the right, the CAMS reanalysis data set. And you see this for one specific year, 2020, the population exposed to the various thresholds of uh, these interim targets for fine particulate matter that I just had discussed. And you see that for countries, um, although broadly it looks similar, like if you look at China and India, sort of a larger proportion is exposed to the most severe level of the WHO interim target, over 35 micrograms per cubic meter, they're not identical. And that causes problems. Here we look at all three of these data sets. So the Plume Labs data sets, we only got data for 2021, 2022, and we'll be adding 2023 to it uh, later on. Um, so that's why it's only a short yellow stripe here on the slide. But you see immediately when we look at OECD and OECD partner countries aggregates, we see this kind of um, steady decline of the global burden of disease data for fine particulate matter, while the CAMS reanalysis data over time actually has a higher population weighted exposure of fine particulate matter. And the Plume Labs data, which is this third private company data, actually is closer aligned to the um, global burden of disease data than the CAMS reanalysis. So that's definitely one of the first challenges when we're starting this analysis, like, okay, which data source we use, and then when we produce similar, the same indicators, just with different data, we get different results. Because the global burden of disease data is um, essentially has a very good timeline, has a good um, 
spatial resolution as well compared to CAMS reanalysis. Um, it's what the data sets we used to produce our core findings for this work. And so we produced all these different kinds of indicators. Essentially, these are just looking at the percentage of population exposed to these various interim targets of the WHO. And then we also produce the um, outdoor um, ambient fine particulate matter concentration or ozone concentration or nitrogen dioxide concentration, but population weighted. Here we see an example for fine particulate matter uh, using the global burden of disease data. And we see that the OECD countries in blue, um, over two decades there is a steady decline um, of the exposure of people to fine particulate matter concentrations. We do see that this um, air quality guideline level from the WHO is not reached even today in OECD countries. In the red you see the OECD partner countries and you see that in the last six to seven years, there's this steep decline, but it's still very high, um, and it's still above the severe interim target for fine particulate matter. And um, there's also, of course, for everyone, you know, it's important to indicate that 2020, there was a COVID-19 pandemic, and that had huge implications for air pollution um, concentrations, so that's something Further analysis will have to work on is figuring out whether this trend, for example, of, of decreasing um, concentrations continues after the pandemic. Here you see the results for um, all the different countries, for example. You see those um, larger countries um, that are part of the OECD partner aggregate, like India, China, all have these very high concentrations even up to today. Um, for Peru, for example, you see this quite stark improvement from the 1990s to 2020. But it's important to note that although it looks like it's improving in many countries, all of these still don't reach the air quality guideline level of having PM2.5 concentrations below um, 5 micrograms per cubic meter. We looked at ozone. Ozone is uh, an air pollutant that usually, at least in the northern hemisphere, is more current when, um, when it's warmer. It has to do with um, interactions with other air pollutants and heat and sunlight has an effect in the production of ozone, ground, ground level ozone at least. But um, you see for OCD countries is um, steady decline also over two decades, um, while there's actually a considerable increase in ozone exposure for um, OCD partner countries. When we look at the kind of population share and the percentage blocks, you see really that for OCD partner countries, for example, over 30 years, it's really gone down up from a 30% that was exposed to now more than half of the population in those countries being exposed. And that's considerable con thinking that OCD partner countries includes countries like China, like India. These are really populated countries. A final example I wanted to give was uh, nitrogen dioxide. Um, nitrogen dioxide is an air pollutant that's often more linked to the urban environment. Um, it's a often considered related to traffic pollution, um, but not only. And um, you can see here the percentage change in um, nitrogen dioxide exposure for all the different subnational regions, large subnational regions of the different countries that we were studying. What you see actually is that even for countries where there is, for example, the national average, which you can see here is a black diamond, even though you can see this kind of, the majority of those are in the positive, it means there, um, there's an improvement in the um, air quality in terms of nitrogen dioxide. Even for those countries, you could still have regions, for example, um, if I can move my pointer. Uh, here, for example, you see France, and then still there's these regions like, for example, Mayotte, or for Greece, there's the northern Aegean. So all of these places essentially um, could have, you know, deteriorating situations of nitrogen dioxide specific exposure, despite a national average, of course, being, um, you know, uh, improving. So it's also important to indicate how, you know, these differences between looking at the national versus the subnational, how, how important this is. So we've produced all of these findings. Um, so what's the problem, really? Um, the problem is that 
the data, sometimes people don't always agree on the data. So here we wanted to look at the comparison between the GBD data we've been using and national data on air pollution. Um, so the background, you see the global burden of disease data. This is an example for the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And in the foreground, you see the National Geo Register and then the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, you can immediately tell spatial resolution is a bit better. And this is an example for 2020. And here you see the results for the national average at the beginning of the graph and then for the different large subnational regions um, using the two different data sources. We, we just looked at the mean fine particulate matter concentration. So we didn't look at population exposure, just simply um, analyzing the, um, the air pollution data sets. And we found that for these large, you know, in most cases, but not always, there's this kind of slightly lower estimate of um, fine particulate concentration compared to the GBD data. Um, and that leaves us, of course, with questions, how, how much impactful is this in terms of our indicator development? At the same time, though, it's important to note that when you see the WHO air quality guideline level, for all of these, for example, even though the estimate using national data is lower, it's still not reaching that WHO air quality guideline level. So in terms of interpretation uh, or policy interpretation, of course, it might not necessarily have a different message, but still um, it's kind of a stark example of how um, national data doesn't always correspond with the global geospatial data sets that are um, available. And, um, and that presents quite a few challenges. I think I will bring it back to my colleague now to give a summary of those challenges. Thank you. So in addition to the spatial differences, we also have a case, at least one, where there were temporal differences. Uh, in a country we saw uh, the temporal trends being completely different in, in a couple of years. So um, clearly um, this, this uh, is challenging for the communication vis-a-vis -vis to the public. And uh, it creates, um, so it, it's, it's uh, the, the key challenge we are dealing with um, in this kind of work. Um, there is, I wanted just to mention, there is a really demand for reanalyzed data products uh, suitable for non-expert audience. So please continue developing this kind of uh, products. Um, if uh, there is anyone in the room who has experience with the Plume Labs data, um, we would uh, be keen uh, to talk to you. Or if you know of any, uh, any, of any study that have, uh, have used it. And finally, um, of course, uh, the reason for doing all this, uh, at least in our uh, context, is to conduct policy analysis to understand which policies have been effective, why, etc. So uh, this uh, this kind of the, the follow natural follow-up phase, um, we have done a similar analysis, and uh, a colleague of ours has done a similar analysis in the for the for the climate policy area. Um, I'll stop here and um, happy to take any questions. Uh, Thank you.